Hey, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world, you have reached Science Saturday Science Chats. <music> Yes, sir. Yes, sir. This is David E. Hilster, and you have reached Saturday Science Chat, sponsored by the John Chappelle Natural Philosophy Society and Dissident Science. I want to thank everybody who's been subscribing. Then Dissident Science, man, we're past four thousand and and continue to grow, and we're reaching that thousand mark. So remember, everybody, if you like this and want to support the channel, make sure you click at least the like button. If not, hit the subscribe button and you'll be alerted when we go live. But today, today, folks, is going to be a great lot of fun. This is where sort of science meets art. As many of you know, I'm, I'm also an artist and a scientist. We're going to be reading, uh, uh, talking with a premier writer. Uh, they're calling him uh, a writer of his generation, the millennials. Amazing writer today. We're going to be talking with him from Hawaii Live. That's why we've shifted our time. Uh, and he just came out with his book, Tao Lin's uh, Leave Society. Um, got it here myself. You should check it out. We'll be talking about that. But uh, before we do that, of course, we want to congratulate everybody who has tuned in. Either we are watching the recording or you are watching this live because it's not a place that normally people go because they're not interested necessarily in being a critical thinker and open mind, of course. It is the mark of an educated mind to be able to entertain a thought without accepting it. What does that mean? Hey, if somebody has a new idea, you should take a look at it. Every time anybody criticizes anything today, everybody is the uh, owner of the truth, but that's not the way it works. But again, I want to thank everybody for joining in. Congratulations to yourself for tuning in and stay tuned. Today is going to be a really, really great show. And by the way, if you are watching this on the recording, you want to get directly to Tao Lin, just fast forward, you'll get get to him. But that's in the future right now. So uh, again, if you don't know who we are, um, boy, I'm, I'm using this mouse button today. What's going on here? Uh, we are uh, we are all in this together. Let's fight the illogical mainstream science and not ourselves, folks. It's not the idea is to, to argue amongst ourselves. We, ha we have to take applaud people even like Tao Lin who go out there and we try to do something different. I mean, life is pretty boring if you pretty much uh, go out there and try to rehash everything that's there or you read science and just accept it blindly. But remember, we're in this together, support each other, even if you don't agree with what people say. So, um, and we are uh, all wrong, of course, as my dad says, some ideas are less wrong than others. Just don't fall in love with your ideas. Just don't. I mean, I've heard so many people, I watch them in the chat and they're just, they talk about as if they know everything. And what we all all know is we all own a part of the truth. As, uh, as Neil Adams says, Neil Adams, a famous cartoonist who's also been on our program, Spider guys doing Batman stuff. Go to Facebook, look up Neil Adams, but he does some great videos on the expanding earth. That's how I got into the expanding earth. Check it out. Neil Adams, expanding earth. He'll, he'll blow your mind with his graphics. But again, we're all wrong. We're just less wrong than others. Don't fall in love with your ideas. But our mission here is to be an organization above all that promotes critical thinking without malice and to be an organization, organization that pu supports, publishes, and promotes serious work outside the mainstream, including uh, books. We've uh, done a number of books. And to provide a form of, of open debate about modern topics in physics, cosmology, cosmology, philosophy, and mathematics. We are really the only organization on the planet Earth that does this um, and uh, open again to serious people who are doing serious uh, work serious and wanting to present serious papers and theories without fear of censorship. And of course, we're run by uh, our members. So uh, if you haven't checked us out uh, and you don't know what this is all about, what do you mean mainstream has problems? Well, it does. And the best place you can go is called beyondmainstream.org. It's on our, our online magazine for critical thinkers. We're coming up to 100,000 views uh, shortly, I think, on our, uh, on our pages there. Check it out. You can click on all the problems in science, click on relativity. You can see over 2000 papers and books about how relativity has got problems. And if you want to join in with other critical thinkers, sort of on a Facebook uh, 
uh, thinking, critical thinking community, go to naturalphilosophy.org, register there, and you will be able to join in the conversations on all kinds of topics like ether and gravity and uh, philosophy and mathematics. Yes, mathematics. I got my bachelor's in mathematics, but I will tell you, the real number system has real problems. I mean, the square root of negative one is probably the biggest. And then besides, think of this, folks. Remember this, if you don't think math's a problem. Uh, think of something in the universe that's negative. I'm not talking about negative charge because that also is an arbitrary thing. We just put a little dash on it. Think of it. Is there anything in the universe that's negative? Yeah. All right. There you go. So this is the kind of place you, if you like those kinds of questions. And of course we do have a Wikipedia because our stuff won't stay on Wikipedia because it's the consensus place. And it is, if you are not proved or being taught in all the universities and you're not consensus, you're considered fringe. But of course we all know that's exactly where science goes forward. It never goes forward from the inside. It comes from the outside. So uh, take a look at that if you haven't. Um, and we do have memberships. Believe me, it's very important. It's about $2,300 for us to uh, keep these things going, our organization going, to bring people on like Tao Lin, who hopefully will even... Uh, I'm going to get him to do a paper in our in our proceedings. We're going to be having a proceedings hopefully this year because of COVID. We've uh, pulled down, but we do papers, scientific papers, and uh, to do all of those kinds of things, uh, we do need support. And we have monthly memberships. You just go to our website to uh, naturalphilosophy.org, click on the memberships there. You can do a monthly five bucks um, all the way up to you know uh, an annual donation or even donations. And it's very important. Uh, your contributions because I wish I was a rich guy, but we all do this as, as uh, uh, volunteers. No one gets paid for this. So um, please consider becoming a monthly or annual membership um, and uh, that would be greatly appreciated. Here are some of our patrons. I do want to recognize Nick Percival. Uh, he, he gave a talk last week. He's giving a talk next week. You want to check it out. Special Relative Time. It was absolutely fabulous. If you missed that last week, go back and watch it. He's going to be talking about time and special relativity and all those things that we're always, people are always interested. Got two more of those coming up. And I want to thank Dr. Cynthia Whitney. She's got her degree in from MIT in special relativity. And the first project, the, uh, uh, she found out that j uh, ring gyroscopes where light goes around in circles violates Einstein's relativity, goes back to her professor and says, what is happening? What do I do? And she goes, well, professor said to her at MIT. Oh, um, yeah, we know. If we know, why why do we have a Facebook page with 20 million people following Einstein and them saying that uh, relativity is needed for GPS when it isn't used in GPS? Because we perpetuate stories over and over and over. So anyways, I want to thank these people, Ramsey also and all uh, for his donations and all the annual monthly memberships. We need your vital support, uh, emphasis on the word vital, vitality, life. That's how we survive. Coming soon, uh, of course, next week, that's this week, I didn't change this, but Tao Lin celebrated author discussed alternative models and topics in physics and cosmology. That's this week. Next week, we have special relativity talk two. And then my dad's gonna be talking about the phys physicality of parallel resistance diode and transit. It's like, why? You guys, Physics doesn't know. If you go to any university on the planet, they're going to they're not, they're not going to tell you how these things work. They don't know. They have lots of empirical equations that work really great. But if you ask them, how does a diode work? How does a transistor work? What is it physically doing? What's what's it really what's really happening inside? No one has it. But we have our model. My dad uh, uh, and I have our physical model of the universe. And he's been applying that to uh, electronics. And he's got a couple simple experiments, which we have shown predictions that we didn't think would ha be happening in electronics. That is. So you don't want to miss that. That's going to be a great. And of course, the great debate, because I'm going to take on the whole world here. And I know this is going to be great. I wish I had. We're going to go back 20 years because the MPA, we had a lot of people who, who uh, did not, who knew all the problems with ether. Somehow we've forgotten those problems and are, we're dreaming again. But regardless, that's my opinion. Don't take it from me because we're gonna have a debate. I have two people already signed up, interested in doing uh, debating with me. And the idea is we're gonna prepare and have a debate. I, well, I got one guy and myself and another person, sort of a neutral person, and we're gonna talk. And I'm gonna to try to convince you, Ether's a really bad model for light. 
So, uh, but don't take my word for it. Never do. That's why I said, uh, stay tuned for that that debate. That's going to be a big one because so many etherists out there. Okay, today we're going to be talking to Tao Lin. Who is Tao Lin? Well, he's a Taiwanese. You can go right to his Wikipedia page. I mean, I, I, I'm not in Wikipedia. I, I think people put me there and then they threw me out as a crackpot because, you know, I made a documentary called Einstein Wrong. It's too bad that we don't have the ability as we do in literature to allow for new and ideas. And that's why Tao Lin is so uh, uh, amazing is because of his uh, style called auto fiction. But he is a Taiwanese American novelist, poet, essayist, short story writer and artist. I did like his uh, check him out on the on YouTube's all over the place. He has published four novels, a novella, two books of poetry, a collection of short stories and a memoir, as well as an extensive assortment of online content. His third novel, Taipei, was published by Vintage in 2013. Uh, his nonfiction book, Trip, Psychedelics, Alienation and Change, was published uh, by Vintage also in 2018. And his fourth novel, which I have right here and I've been reading it. Uh, he is Leave Society, published um, by Vintage in 2021. So really great to be talking with him. Here's a picture of him in his younger days, probably smiling right now. Uh, this is uh, his uh, novel Taipei, uh, which came out, which really put him on the map. Uh, and his second book, um, I believe this illustrations from the New York Times, yeah, folks. I mean, the New York Times, uh, the only the only way I get in that paper is to buy it and lay down on it. So um, anyways, Trip Psychedelics, Alienations and Change, Tao Lin. And I love that. His cover is his mandala. And I think that's bigger than life, believe me, at least on my screen here, because I have my screen over here that I watch over here. And uh, those things are like eight by eight inches. Those I, I love to see one of those in, in person because they're so the guys. I don't know how he works on them. I think he takes his glass off in near sight or something like that but really great book do you want to check it out and of course his latest book uh leave society a, a novel and uh let me uh show you some of the uh, uh reviews on his book oh the new york times yeah christine smallwood is the uh, uh she's an author of of a novel the life of the mind she wrote this and i highlighted some of this it says this novel is, historically speaking, a form of alienation. But with Leave Society, Lin has set, his, set himself the project of writing an unalienated novel. Stylistic, the book is artful, even radical. Yes, it is. I mean, I am i haven't read an auto fiction before, and it just, it's, I'm still shifting gears. I mean, I'm still shifting gears, so I'm still not through it, but it is pretty amazing. And I've, I've uh, I'll watched in, uh, a lot of interviews about his book and, and things, and we'll be talking about that. And of course, The New Yorker on Leaf Society, a uh, part that I found interesting is Lynn's book of auto fiction have made him something of a darling in the alt lit scene where they're dis disaffected sincerity has earned him the title, although we have so many of these now, the voice of his generation, namely the millennial one, with his infinitely meditated sentimentality. Yes, um, quite quite amazing uh, uh, reviews on this book. And this is from the Yahoo News on Leave Society. Uh, it was up to Lynn, I'm reading just the last part, it was up to Lynn, a writer who for so long seemed completely disconnected from his from his humanity to write the most deeply human book of the year. So quite amazing, quite uh, uh, well-deserved, and we're gonna bring him up. He was so, so kind to uh, come to us. Uh, it is just past eight in the morning in Hawaii. Uh, welcome, Tao, how are you? I'm good, thank you for having me on. I'm a big fan of your channel, Dissident Science. Yes, folks. I mean, he's not I didn't pay him to say that because I don't have money to do that anyways. But uh, he said you've, you've watched almost like 40 hours. I was sort of surprised. I found that out from George Coyne, who happens to say hello um, here. In fact, uh, yeah, I'll put it down here. You can see down here. Greetings to Dave Talin and everyone watching. So uh, you I found out from you. I get this. Just I'll tell you my story and then we'll get to your story. I get an email from this guy called Talin. I don't know who the heck he is because I get a lot of emails because of what I do. I support people. I'm out there to support you, whether I, I, I 
uh, agree with you or not. I support anybody else trying to come up with new ideas. So I got it and I read the article, which we're gonna take a look at today. And it's like, whoa, this is really good. And not only that, it's well-researched. He had some people in there that I have great respect for, and we're gonna be looking at that. And then I told him, why don't you think about coming on the program? And then I sort of left it there. And I, I don't know if he's, I think you responded. Then next thing I know, I, I was talking with George Coyne, who was on a little while ago, and he goes, oh yeah, Tao Lin wants to be on your program. I go, well, I sent, he said, yeah, who? I said, who's that? He goes, oh, it's this famous writer. And I go, what? All I know is he wrote this article. So the good news is I'm judging you by your article. I did not judge you because you're a famous uh, 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 author. And uh, mm -hmm. just like we had another guy, uh, Neil Adams, a very famous uh, cartoonist. Look up Neil Adams. He is uh, known for his uh, cartoons of Batman, just amazing artist. And he has this expansion uh, tectonic. So um, that's sort of how we met. Now, tell me, the, the, I think the most curious question, well, I guess we can, let's talk about your book first, because when we get into science, we'll probably have a hard time coming back to that. So tell me um, a, a little bit about a couple of things. For those people in our audience who don't know what autofiction is, why don't you tell us what that is first? What, what, what is that? Because I was totally unawares uh, of what that was. I think it's a type of fiction which can be short stories or a novel where the author uses their own life as the narrative and they may or may not be also working on that novel throughout the novel yeah that is just mind-blowing in fact it's funny because the novel i can give a little away but um you the, at the end the the character and goes to hawaii with his partner which of course that's what you did so i was it really took me a while to understand sort of what that was it's almost like what we call in mathematics or computer science recursion that is so it's like when you get in a mirror and you see two mirrors right and they're parallel to each other you stand in there and you see yourself like mirrored all the way back um how how it i mean first of all what stimulated you to write your latest book uh leave society what was why why'd you write it i think the main reason was and I can place this within a bigger narrative of how I started to doubt society later on, but it was because of health reasons, personal health reasons. I had back pain for years and also not personal health reasons, also health reasons with my parents but mostly just getting more into natural health. Okay, natural mm -hmm. health. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, I uh, nine years ago, I went on a whole plant-based diet. I had, my family has a history of heart disease, right? And at that point I was 40, I, no, I was 52. I, I had been married like 17 years. We planned that to have a kid later in life. And then I, at 80, at, at 52, I'm thinking, I'm having heart attack symptoms. I'm having heart problems. So I went out and started reading. And next thing I know, I, I read about whole plant-based diet, how it can reverse heart disease. And here I am, zero heart disease, uh, made it to 62, passed my great grandfather, my grand grandfather's life. My dad's been on it, uh, even though he had some heart, he has had heart, heart problems to live a longer time. So yeah, I mean, the, the whole health side. And then the funny thing is once I got into it, it was more than just the personal health of me feeling great at my age but it was also the planet our 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 morals of the way we farm animals which is just super horrific um it just it, it, there's this terrible like energy and i'm i'm not even i believe the whole world's physical but i'm talking about it in the sense of feelings and human emotions so um you know, so that was part of your journey in a very different way now I have a question about, because we don't want to talk too much about your book. We want people to read it. Um, mm -hmm. I have a question. In this kind of style, there's a lot of different types of ways people create art. I, I do 
art as a painter. Sometimes it'll take me a long time to finish a painting. Other times I'll get to a painting eight foot by five foot and in two hours finish it. Mm -hmm. is, is, when you write, I, I, I can tell by your reading list, oh, I didn't even do that. In fact, that's a, a good thing we'll get to as a transition. I forgot I do have your reading list. But as a person who writes auto fiction, which is sort of based on yourself, allows you to go in directions that sort of almost like a parallel universe. Do you, and you do a lot of reading, because if you look on your website, there's a, a heck of a lot of different types of books. How much do you craft it? Do you go back and like back and reread it and craft it? Or is it more, uh, our parts just flow? How does that work for you? I, I'm just curious because when a person reads this, there can be an uh, idea that maybe it's a lot more, it's just like a flow of consciousness. It's not that sort of prepared, but I get a feeling by reading it, it doesn't just happen that way, or am I wrong? Yeah, you're right about that. Yeah, I do try to make it have a flow, but it, it takes a lot of work to get it that way for me, especially because in this novel, I started incorporating nonfiction research into it. And right. one thing I put in it near the end is the idea that the Big Bang is wrong. And we could talk about that later. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. So, so you do go back. I mean, you're when you when you were writing this on your computer. Obviously, you're going back, take looking at things. And this this time, you're saying you're doing actually some more research. That is, mm -hmm. and, and and it sounds like to me that it seems important to you to actually try to find people talking about this. In other words, the talking about the Big Bang. You're not talking about the first three trillionths of a second of the Big Bang. You're actually looking at it in today's world where there's a lot of people who say hey maybe the big bang is not correct mm -hmm. is 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 that part of this journey as well i mean that is, it seems to be very different in that sense yeah the big bang is part of my journey i don't know how much of my journey i've told though but it is a part of it right a part of it where i keep learning that things i've learned growing up were totally wrong yeah boy is that true and yeah it's just it's been happening since i was a kid i feel like i remember one time my brother telling me or he told me a lot of times that milk contained antibiotics and came from diseased cows and then our family stopped drinking milk. Oh, yeah. And then... Dairy is a huge problem. It causes so many problems. In fact, it's pretty much linked the hormones that the, these cows get and even just the regular stuff that's in cow's milk has shown mm -hmm. that it's one of the major re reasons, for instance, puberty in girls has moved on the average before people drank dairy and ate a lot of dairy because it was very expensive. In the 1800s, people didn't have cheese. They didn't have milk. They had some on the farm, but most people didn't. And, that, and people at that time, girls were you know, menstruating at 17. Now it's happening at 10 and 11, and there's nothing physiologically that's happened to us. So let's, uh, this is a good transition here. Let's take a look at your website for those people who uh, want to know more about you. We're gonna do two things. We're gonna take a look at your website. Here's his website. And on there, he has this link called Books I Read. And I decided to go through some of these uh, and highlight some. And of course, I'm highlighting the science stuff, but if you look at them, they're just, all kinds of things all over. And you're a pr pretty prolific reader already in 2022. Um, number six, we all know everybody who is, uh, who's in this area of physics and uh, cosmology, the structure of scientific revolutions, Thomas Kuhn. In fact, I got a video on that claiming that um, it, it, we're in model re revolution right now, even though I don't agree with Kuhn's selection of the revolutions, but that's a very common book. Um, also, you have uh, Conceptions of Cos the Cosmos from Myths to Accelerating Universe, The History of the Cosmology. I've not read that, that one myself. Um, and our book, Principia Mathematica 2, Complete Toolkit for Hacking the Universe, 2021. If you go down further, 
very, um, I've got this book too right behind me, uh, Seeing Red, Red Shifts uh, Cosmology and Ac Academic Science by Halton Arp. I would imagine the from the myths and the accelerating universe and the scientific revolution uh, uh, revolutions, I can see the Big Bang all over this, right? Seeing red, the infinite universe theory with Glenn Borkert, mm -hmm. famous. So you, this was, you wrote this book. It came out when? When would you? When did you finally finish the book? It was in last year at some time. It was in twenty twenty, and then. Yeah, after the book, I continued researching physics and cosmology. Right. At first, for this article for Document Journal. Right. But also, I've been thinking about including it as one chapter in the book. Oh. That would okay. be focused on a larger topic, like aliens, possibly. Oh, okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. All right. So um, let's. I'm going to go back uh, a little bit further. The Higgs fake. Uh, you read as well. Mm -hmm. A number of books. I think this is too, my goodness, you are a voracious reader. It's funny because, again, a lot of times when people read your style would think that you're not uh, versed in the tradition of or, or reading. But, you know, to me, the best writers are voracious readers. But you read, read the uh, Higgs fake. When you read that, that should have that pretty much blew your mind, didn't it? Yeah, it did. I have it here. Yeah, it's, I mean, yeah. I found Alexander Unzlicker through your channel. You introduced me to him, and he's just so funny. I think. Oh His yeah. Style yeah. of criticizing and analyzing particle physics, and yeah. yeah. And I recommend you watching a video with David somebody, somebody maybe in the chat could give me, the guy who won the Nobel Prize, an American uh, physicist who won the Nobel Prize for, I guess, simplifying the particle model, which is a joke, which is somewhat a joke in reality. But Alexander Unziger uh, uh, interviews this guy. And in the beginning, he's st standing, sitting there pontificating, you know, they're very puffy chests and talking as if I'm a Nobel Prize winner and everything I say is the truth. And Unsucker is looking back, he had two cameras so he could edit them back and forth. And he would ask some questions because in his 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 mind, all of this stuff is just basically arbitrary packages of stuff with arbitrary attributes. You know, there's no real phys physical reasons even for them to be doing a lot of this because they're justifications. But as the interview goes on, he gets on his chair more and he's realizing this guy is not not asking the questions just to praise him and asking fundamental questions about uh, some of the work because he's a physicist as well that there really are no answers. And he would, he ends up during the interview, he had this mic on, literally taking the mic and holding it in his hand and he moving forward because he was so upset with the idea that someone disagreed with, it just didn't, you know, believe what he was saying, the words, what we call magical words, what we call science poetry. It's a lot of science poetry. And so uh, I recommend anybody take a look at that interview because you're gonna see Unsker really put him on the hot seat. Although Alexander Unsker confessed to me um, many years after I met him that he wasn't so certain writing that book was good for his career. You know, that's that's pretty tough. So uh, it wasn't good for his career. He has other books on a oh yeah he wasn't similar topic right yes absolutely. But mm. I was talking about the scientific part. He's he's oh. he's been trying to pull back a little bit not because he doesn't believe it but you know uh, but he gave a lot of lectures i don't know if you've seen his lectures he'd go to a lecture hall where he's going to talk about physics right and mm -hmm. at the beginning some of his lecture halls he literally says this he goes uh i know a lot of you people uh were assigned to come here but and you know the topic i'm going to talk about uh, so if you are inclined uh, to leave, I'll give you a time, you know, you can take this time to leave. And there was one where you heard some chairs scraping <laughs> and people leaving the audience. Because mm -hmm. cause I don't know if you've seen some of those. Those are pretty Yeah, that's interesting because he thinks that everything after 1930 is wrong in mainstream yeah. physics. Yeah. But he still believes in Einstein's theories of relativity. Yeah, yeah. And mm -hmm. it's one of... Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, has he ever talked to you about that? Or yeah, I, it's that? A, yeah, that's a good. 
you know, that you're, you're bringing up a, a point. Um, uh, there's some more I, I have here, but I'm going to take this down. We're going to get back to our discussion here before we get into your article. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, it's interesting to me how people I see as great scientists don't always get on board with all the things happening out, you know, in, on the latest of, uh, for instance, uh, Glenn mm -hmm. Borkert. Glenn Borkert is going to go down in history for his work. Uh, in, a, in infinity and the 10 assumptions of science. Absolutely, he's written in stone, but he works as a geologist in the traditional geology, which he has said to me, David, I know there's overwhelming evidence for ex tech, tech, tecton uh, expansion tectonics that the Earth's, Earth's expanding, but he says, I don't subscribe to it. And why doesn't he subscribe to it? Well, he makes a good living with regular uh, uh, plate tectonics. So he can't go on record to have somebody say, oh, I believe this because they're not going to hire him, you know. And so he doesn't subscribe to that. So here's a person who you admire a lot, who even says to you, I know that's probably right, but I don't subscribe to it. Um, you know, we have other people in the, in the same boat. Um, Alexander Unsker, as you noted, he doesn't talk a lot about the relativity part. He has sort of tried to talk about Einstein's other kind of ideas, so he kind of stays away from that. But yeah, I mean, there's a person that um, doesn't talk about Einstein being wrong. Uh, the Electric Universe and Wal Thornhill. I don't know, you know about him, right? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. It's, it's, no, go ahead. No, yeah, I'm sorry. But uh, basically, um, when I met him and we had our conferences back in 2010, over 10 years ago, we had the Electric Universe together with us. And they sort of looked at us as, oh, they're the anti-Einstein uh, group. And they would oh. sort of chuckle amongst themselves because they really okay. hadn't th thought of it. Yeah. Go 10 years forward, he, uh, Wal Thornhill is a very logical man in his mind. He's very, you know, can think logically. He, I, next thing I see 10 years later, he's going on YouTube talking about how Einstein's wrong. So I have to give him credit for evolving himself, right? And I think that's, in the beginning of this, I talked about how people fall in love with the system. The universe is super complex. It's real easy to come up with a way it works in your head, right? And then I, I start using that and I start thinking about in that model. And, but you, if you fall too much in love with it, you, you don't, see the other things around you so yeah it's it's quite it's quite interesting so you you had you read these books uh, and they also influenced the article that we're going to be taking a look look at is that correct yes that's correct before we go on i wanted to respond to the topic about how borkard is aware of problems with mainstream physics but in his own field can't like right. promote this idea right. that the earth is expanding. Right. And one thing I really like about your organization is that you create community where a lot of people disagree with each other, but are yeah. still able to find common ground and work on those areas because it seems impossible to me for everyone to unlearn everything they've learned growing up yeah. it takes so much time to absorb one thing and it also creates it changes your relationships with people in your life because then you're gonna have to explain it to all of them and that takes more energy so it seems good to find things you agree on and work on that, which is why I like your organization a lot. And I had a question about that, about the John Chappelle Natural Philosophy Society. Yeah, yeah, go ahead. The only other Chappelle I've heard of is Dave Chappelle. <laughs> and, but I haven't heard that much about John Chappelle. I've just heard you mention him, him a lot. Could you yeah. say a little bit about him? You're the president of this society. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I met John Chappelle was I think he got his PhD in from Harvard or Yale or somewhere. But we have his. you can go to beyond um, beyond mainstream.org anybody and take a look at his bio. 
but the he was the first person he really came from the the relativity side he knew like a lot of people that relativity was wrong and he wanted to uh, find like minds and to actually debate people he actually in the early 90s set up debates between himself and physicists at a university it was unbelievable because we we can't do that now they they won't they will not do it and so he started that and it was in a time where the internet was just starting in the early 90s but he had done it earlier and basically they got it from bibliographies from things they read from people um universities phone calls literally looking and and talking by phone and at that time they used typewriters and did a newsletter so their whole thing was we're going to take on einstein and relativity because we all know it's wrong but we need to organize ourselves so that we can come up with a way to you know get this information out and so he started this um, um organization called the natural philosophy alliance in the early 1992 and they would meet around the country they would meet like um you know in colorado or uh, california he was from california st louis obispo i think is where he left and um they would go and they even had some i think meetings in st petersburg um russia but these weren't huge events these were events with a dozen people at most but they really brought together people who really were like-minded who like you said a community where you could get together and debate without you could stand up there and say the big bang's wrong or you can get up there and say ether is the correct model um, and if you looked at the early organization it really started out with relativity special relativity especially and then started branching out because other people heard about it then you got um dr um uh, Ed, edward dowdy from nasa guy from nasa who said oh by the way general relativity is also wrong because general is supposed to to curve light around uh, gravity supposed to curve life well he he uh, worked in the laser optical section of nasa and he says oh by the way when you look outside the corona of the sun which still has gravitational effect there is no bending of light at all. And he says, what's really happening is you're getting bending of a light close to the sun because there's a corona and just like water, it bends light. We know this is a fact. Mm -hmm. So so we got, got him. Then we had people start uh, questioning the Big Bang. And um, at that time, interestingly enough, in NPA, it was a time where um, the MPA was talking, uh, there were uh, mostly anti-etherists, people who didn't believe in, in ether. At that time, if you were an etherist, you were sort of shunned because there are a lot of bad arguments against ether. There's just a ton. You can't describe a laser. You, you can't. La you know, people try to manipulate it so you can. Ether's been an idea for 400 years. It's never been conquered, whatever. But at that time in the MPA, it's- I have a question about that, actually. Yeah, yeah. About when you say there is no ether in your model, you say there's no ether, but when I look at your particle model, yeah, those it seems there's... like there is an ether, but it's just not the mechanism for light. No, it, it's a good question, and it's a very mm -hmm. good question. The, the answer is we have four movements in this particle model, but ether is like air, okay? Ether is like air. It has to be sort of stationary, and that's why I think ether, that's the biggest argument for me is why ether in space doesn't make sense. It's got to sort of be around, and then it transmits waves by bashing around. So one particle kind of stays here, and is and it transmits by bashing around. In our model, model, my dad's model for light, it's basically waves of light, just like waves of bombers. So they're traveling together. So the light actually travels. And what it is, it's not a light. Light doesn't come from a particle. There's no particle. Light is actually waves of particles that hit hit you. So if, if you're, this is, this is light because there's a frequency. And your eyes getting these these pulses that's how we get a color that's how we, we see so yeah. ether is a stationary thing uh our model is the the waves are waves of particles there's a bunch of waves and there's the w wavelength of blue has a bunch of waves of particles being emitted in in waves and they travel all across the universe whereas the ether of the light from a sun from 10 billion light years has to come by collisions literally 
and it's so, that's the other problem. One of the biggest, um, uh, uh, how do you say, criticisms of ether is you can imagine collision, right? That is things hitting each other to travel for 10 billion light years and collide that way. And this, this, that's one of the biggest problems. The, the elasticity, because you know, with, with sound, it doesn't travel very far, right? It well, maybe travels a hundred miles if you have the most loudest thing ever. But if you can imagine if, if like ether for, for light to travel 10 billion light years, this medium has to have special properties that are just astronomical. So mm -hmm. there, are two, there are three models for light. There's a lattice, meaning the whole universe is sort of like this lattice and things just kind of flip on and off almost digitally. That's one idea. The other idea is the ether, where things are waves through a medium that stays pretty much in the same place. Yes, it can travel, but in general, it's not traveling. The, in ether, light doesn't travel 10 billion light years. What it is, it's like the wave in the water travels 10 billion light years. Mm -hmm. and, and then in our model, it's different. Those particles actually get sent out from 10 billion light years away and they come to our eye 10 billion light years later. So it's, mm -hmm. it's traveling. So. Yeah, and I, but I feel like your model and the etherist model agree in that you both say that there's tinier and tinier particles going down. In that it, yeah, what your tinier and tinier particles is is Borkert's infinity. Not mm -hmm. all etherists. If you look at most mm -hmm. etherists, they don't have that. Mm -hmm. um, I'll give you a great, great. And again, one of the great things about and I love this. I, I love all these models. I love the different models. I love people's. I like to read about ether models because I want to see if they can solve those problems. I like systems. I like to see. And so one one of the things is is um, uh, with I'm sorry, what was the question again? I'm sorry. I don't know, but the mainstream model is that is that there is a smallest particle. Oh right? yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what you're talking about. The different levels. Jeff mm -hmm. Yee has a great model. It's an ether model, but he doesn't talk about all the levels down. Borker mm -hmm. does, and we do. If anybody probably does, it's those two. Uh, two those two. His is an ether model. Ours is a uh, is different. Are they different? They are very, very different in that form. But in that sense, yeah, the, the commonality there is the infin infinite up and infinite down. For sure. mm -hmm. Yeah, I like how simple and intuitive your model or you and your dad's model is. How it. Yeah, makes... it is. It's, it is intuitive. In fact, one of the things the reason we came up with them, our model in particular is ever since I was born, I love science and I love the universe and, and I wanted to know what is this stuff? There's magnetism, there's electricity, there's light, there's gravity. I'm tired of people giving me equations. I got my master, my uh, doc, my, I don't have you, I, I'm a uh, bachelor's in mathematics. I love math, but math is not physics, right? Math is not physics. Math doesn't tell you what gravity is. Newton never said what gravity was. Um, Einstein says it's space time. He never tells us what that is. So our model was the first, I think is the first attempt to say, here's physicality for everything, right or wrong, right or wrong. We've got things wrong, I'm sure in there, but it has a system where you can, you can point to something as real. This is what light is. This is what gravity is. This is what magnetism is. So in that sense, the average person can get this, right? They know movements. Oh, if it goes in the circle, it's magnetic. If it's going in all different directions, random, it's a gravity field. If it's moving in waves, like my shower, if I turn it on massage, oh, that's like light. Yeah, it, it is it, it is easier for people. That's that's one thing. OK, um, I thought maybe we can. This is a good time to get into your article and um, I can put that article. Uh, if you want to get to his article, let me uh, just change this here. Um, I made a nice shortcut way for you at home watching to get to the um, article, uh, his article directly. I made this um, shortcut, uh, it's called subdomain. If you go to Tau, um, in fact, I'm gonna do that over here. I'm gonna go over to, to tau.naturalphilosophy.org. It's already there, hit return and voila, we get to your article, there you go. So um, I'm gonna, we're gonna read through this article. I'm gonna make this a little bit bigger. First of all, the art is great. Um, this was original art. Did you have an artist work with you or a graphic person or they did that afterwards? No, they did all that. I'm not even, I don't know who the artist is. 
yeah but it's quite it's quite quite good yeah so like yeah it's very good so this is a tell me a little bit of how did you come about writing these i guess you've written a couple of articles for this tell us uh, the story behind this i came about writing it just because the magazine an editor at document journal emailed me or we've been in touch for around a year and she asked if I wanted to write something for this issue. And she said it could be something related to my book that had come out, Leave Society. So I chose the topic of the Big Bang being wrong. So the and Big that, Bang is is that in in the in uh your Leave Society? Mm -hmm. It's near the end. The yeah, character. that's why that's why I haven't gotten there yet. So mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. You haven't gotten there. It's just a few pages about watching or reading the book, The Big Bang Never Happened by Eric Lerner and watching the documentary on YouTube about the Big Bang being wrong and talking about that with his oh, did you did, did you see it was a cosmology quest? Was, was that what you watched? Yeah, yeah. That was yeah, fun. I talk with, I, I'm a friend with Randall Myers. Believe it or not, the guy who made that documentary back in the early 1990s is a composer for orchestra for for films and has made quite a good living. I don't know if he's a millionaire, but he may be close to it. So he's, an, he's a film score. He makes scores for films like, you know, uh, you know, Leonard Bernstein or something like that. And uh, he decided that he got into this like you did, and he decided to make this documentary. And uh, he, the only thing he, he regrets about it, he says, that unless you're interested in the subject as a documentary, even if, if you're not interested in the subject, it puts you to sleep. He said whenever he wanted his, his friends to come over and sleep, he'd put up his documentary. But the documentary, if you do love the, the you know the, uh, the big bang it's absolutely worth it so so mm -hmm. so she she approached you and re you wrote this so the uh tell me what's the idea uh your the whole idea is the big bang uh it, it could be wrong reconsidering it and that the theory could save you so i'm going to actually just let me read some of this and we'll we'll go through here uh Tao Lin takes a closer look at science creation stories examining their implications for human culture at large the universe was created nothing uh from nothing 13.8 billion years ago, according to the current version of the Big Bang Theory, first proposed by Edgar Allan Poe in 1848, the theory became increasingly popular after Belgium astronomer priest George Alimentre uh, suggested a form of it in 1927, endorsed by Albert Einstein, Catholic Church, um, and the New York Times, of course, in 1965, and by the 1980s had become a dominant cosmology. And you go on then to say four decades, decades later, the Big Bang remains dominant and often stated as fact, but what if it's wrong? Could it be keeping away the uh, for, uh, keeping us away from exploring supposedly unattainable technologies like anti-gravity, faster than light travel, and powerful forms of clean er energy? Um, you'll, I'll go on to say, um, I've come to suspect uh, after, uh, this is what I come to suspect after spending four years researching classified government projects, extraterrestrials, cosmology, and has been called the queen of sciences because in it forms every other discipline. Um, so you, you did, you go right into uh, uh, cultural effects, what makes sense to scientists, observed Eric learner and the big bang never happened um so you 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 wrote that book uh tell me a little bit about were, were you a person when when you were writing about this or looking into it were you curious i mean with me i know what happens with me when i sort of got exposed to something that we were taught all our lives is right was this a fun place for you to go was it uncomfortable you didn't have really a skin in the game so it doesn't really matter you know what were you thinking when you got these kinds of books were you thinking thinking it could be crackpot or what, what what's your what is your attitude when you go into something like that by this time in 2020 when i read the big bang never happened i was actively searching for ways in which something I had learned is wrong. And it was fun to me and exciting and it produced all in wonder because the normal view of things 
with cosmology, it seems so grim and limited that the universe is only 13 billion years old compared to like even a trillion years old. That's such a huge, huge difference. Right. right. And the mainstream view is saying that everything just came out of nothing for no reason. <laughs> it just seems so bleak and unbelievable. Yeah. And you mentioned that the Big Bang documentary that the director said it would be boring for anyone not interested in the Big Bang. But I think it would also be very interesting just to anyone interested in ways the mainstream is wrong because yeah. it's such a fun topic yeah. that Einstein talking about physics and cosmology that Einstein might be totally wrong. Like we've always been taught that he's the smartest person that there ever is. And he's a genius. And I hadn't heard of this until like 2020 this idea that Einstein is wrong. And I enjoyed your documentary, by the way, Einstein wrong. I liked how accessible it was. Oh, so you did watch it? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I enjoyed it a lot. Oh, well, thank I you very like much. When dealing with, with, with ideas out of the mainstream, making it accessible is yes. really important. Yeah. Like, not alienating people, but gradually trying to convince them of things. The gradualness seems important because otherwise you'll just like yeah. air them away. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the whole idea there was to take my mom, who was like the typical suburban housewife, to meet these people and let her, you know, start chewing on all this stuff. One of my favorite parts in the movie of the documentary was when my mom was talking to a person and she goes up to him and she's eating something. And she goes, so do you think gravity is a push or a pull? And this guy was there at the MPA conference with like a poster presentation and it wasn't necessarily in his area. But of course, we all think of all these things. And the guy was kind of stymied. He didn't know what to say. And uh, then my mom goes on, well, you know, what? when I was a kid, I always thought about it. Is it pushing me or is it pulling me? What is that? And uh, it was interesting to see her with time. In fact, the interesting part of that, that my mom came as a conclusion was she thinks that if Einstein was alive today, he would say, OK, yeah, relativity's wrong. You know, it's interesting that we impose, we as a society tend to impose our you know, we were start worshiping these people and we expect them if they were alive to absolutely believe everything. And there was a lot of doubt in a lot of these people's minds, even Newton. I mean, Newton had all kinds of doubt. He, if people ask him, oh, you're the father of gravity, he says, don't ever accuse me of ever knowing what gravity is. Right. So it's quite interesting. And here, another part you said here is interesting. It says another problem is that theory needs much more gravity than stars and other known matter uh, produce gravity that has been attributed to dark matter. Two other anomalies have been explained away with terms inflation and dark energy. These may be what scientists call ad hocs, things that are invented to save theory from conflicting from evidence. So um, you start to see, I think this is kind of, I think it's interesting what really got me when I read your article and why I wanted to have you on is you can see from a higher level. One of the things is once you start, you take away the curtain and start to look at things with a critical eye, you can see the ad hocs, you can see the science poetry that people use. They go talk, 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 and it sounds so convincing. But when you tr when you try to peel it back and say, OK, this is physics and cosmology, what's going on here? You know, just the word dark is to me is is a, is I'm a, I got a you know, I'm in linguistics. I work with computers and language. I think about every word, what it means. You know, the whole thing of dark energy or dark matter is a way it is ad hoc. That's what it is. I mean, is that is that something I know my mom went from reading articles before the fi the film Einstein wrong to just reading them and saying oh this is interesting stuff you know oh, i don't know if i okay to the point where when at the after the end of the film 
she would send me articles and say, Dave, did you read this? This is ridiculous what they say. And mm -hmm. it wasn't, it, and she's not looking at and saying, oh, the equation 44 has a negative sign where it should be positive. She's looking at and saying, they are just talking out their butts, which is a little less, uh, uh, you know, and, and she could, as a lay person, she could no longer read these things with a straight face. She could see through it. Is that something that happened to you? Yeah, I found Eric Thurner's arguments and then later your arguments and the arguments of your guests. Another one is George Coyne. You published oh, yeah. a book. Just very convincing. And it's also been fun and funny to learn these things and also a relief because reading about dark matter and the Big Bang in the past, like, and about relativity, I just could never understand it. Like something didn't make sense about it. Yeah, I think yeah. part. I think I think what it is. I came up with a saying. I come up with the, during the years. I didn't have my own theory or model. It was never something I wanted to do. I really didn't. I mean, I collected things that I thought were really good in my own mind. Things like I really like this, like yourself. I like Borchardt's infinity. I like Yonel Deneu's underwater uh, explanations for magnetism. It was just too perfect for me in my my sense. Um, I liked uh, uh, the uh, nucleus recently of Jeff Yee. I like my dad's model. Uh, but um, when you when you go and you you look at um, gosh, I'm losing my trains of thought today. What were, <laughs> talking, what were we were talking about again? I've got to remember things. Mm. I said it was a relief that to learn that Einstein might be wrong because I could never understand him in the past. Oh, yes, yes. And there's so many quotes of quantum physicists uh, saying, like, you can't understand quantum mechanics. And it's just Einstein was reportedly, reportedly he said something about how only 12 people would be able to understand his theory. Yeah. The New York Times wrote about that. So it's a relief and encouraging that he's actually wrong. And it's not that everyone's just stupid or not smart enough or just not able to understand cosmology and physics. It's actually that it's wrong. Right. And that it just leads to wonder too because then you start learning the ways in which it might actually be and it seems much more interesting and complex for example infinity that there might be more levels to the universe going up and down like up towards stars and galaxies and down towards atoms forever I like in your book how when you write about this concept of infinity that you got from Borkard, you point out that this allows other worlds to exist in the universe without having to say it's in another dimension. Yeah, that, that's up yes. or down somewhere. Yes. Yeah. One of the problems you, you hear about is the multiverses, right? That's what mm -hmm. it is. And you yeah. say also that you're open to other beings of like life being up or down which is Helping interesting you. yeah i've noticed you say a few things like that yeah. are you interested in science fiction no you know it's funny i'm actually i think uh, um i think for me uh, i do like science fiction i grew up uh, i'm 62 so i grew up with the space sh sh moonshots i mean i used to make toothpick models with Elmer's glue of the lunar lander because I was just I love space every time National Geographic would come out I'd wait to get all the pictures from the moon I was totally loved that and so I've loved you know 2001 the space odyssey when it first came out the Star Wars all that stuff I was into that I guess what's happened is that the science fiction to me has turned into the mainstream science 
And the fight for that to me is much more important, at least to me personally, um, because I think one of the people way, things people ask me as an artist is, um, why do you, you know, I mean, as a person, why do I fight this? Why do I, why do I do this? And it's the art side of me, because as an artist, if you are a writer, when I paint something or I do something or I make a film, it has to be breaking ground. It has to be new. It has to show a truth that people don't know about. It's a new truth. It can be just a truth that the way you see the world, whether it's your mandala or it's a painting that I have of my wife in a way that, you know, is not rea reality, but it's like, you know, whatever it is. So I think that's what's happened. And, and one of the things I came up with as a saying of mine here, it's like I put this meme, it says the universe isn't complicated and paradoxical. Our theories are and this must change. So I think I think that's that's something that I think has really driven me. I, I'm not so much. And, and the other thing you had mentioned, too, is like you talk about in this article, you talk about um, you know, new, new technologies, new things you can do um, in our book. I mean, for us to have infinite levels, you can't, one of the things that, that infinity, all the levels, what people ask why? Well, the reason why is, is if you came down to saying the whole universe was made out of one particle, right? I think I talk about this in the book too, in our book with my dad and I, if you have one particle and the whole universe is made out of it, how does it organize itself? All of a sudden, does it have like a computer, computer program that starts going and it now makes the whole universe? Well, what happens is we are a product of everything above us and below us. And we just happen to be on this kind of fractal part of the universe where this is what happens, right? We have these atoms and we have these beings. And to me, the idea that you have this, you know, one singular, you know, particle to that everything can be made out of or is impenetrable, you know, just doesn't doesn't make sense. So I think that's what that's happened to me. Let's let's go back to your article here. And um, let's see for through this Apple cycles. Um, here's something where um, you said there there would be no more nuclear meltdowns, oil spills, fracking, power lines, new pipelines, new roads, traffic jams, blackouts, or monthly energy bills. Largest in industry energy would change from being destructive and unsustainable to helpful and healing. I think this is getting to part, you know, who has talked about this a lot and I've not thought about as much And your article sort of helped me revisit this idea is that all of this stuff that we've been doing, even, you know, our technology, the way we're destroying the planet, um, the, the way we have greed that just kills people because money is more important, all of these things, it seems to be all related and it even it seems to be related into the sciences. Tell me a little bit about how did you make a leap from the Big Bang being wrong to this kind of statement? The Big Bang is based on Einstein's model of gravity, right? Right. Yeah, and it seems like mainstream physics cosmology so it uses all of mainstream physics views on other stuff like gravity and matter. So, so, and then go wait, ahead. go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. I'm trying to connect. It's all right. It's not an easy question, but I mean, obviously, and then mainstream physics using mainstream physics society has produced can you scroll back up so i can look at that oh has yeah i'm sorry produced... oh, i'm sorry sorry about that i forgot i was watching, looking at that i didn't mm. oh, yeah. it produced mainstream physics produced all these things and then as i re researched other physics alternative physics i saw that mainstream physics was wrong on all these important matters like gravity and matter and light and at the same time, I'd also been researching classified projects and this thing that is called free energy, which is alternative forms of powerful and clean energy that people have invented since like the late 1800s. Tesla talked about it a lot. And these kinds of free energy machines don't 
go by mainstream physics. They go by other physics, alternative physics. So the Big Bang by making everyone believe in it in mainstream physics is keeping a lot of people away from working on alternative oh, yes. physics that could produce cleaner energy. I see. I yeah. See. I see. I see. So, um, and the new roads, because these alternative physics could also, I feel like, produce anti gravity craft, which wouldn't require roads. And running on electricity would just create a world that would be much cleaner. Right. Yeah. So, so, so part of it is that with the way I say it, until we talk about we have uh, we have qu equations all over the place i mean nasa has them spacex has them to mm -hmm. to calculate where things are going to be in space we have all the the calculations to know where some mass is going to be at some time and how how much force it needs to push it but we have no description we have no model for gravity we have no model for light we have no mm -hmm. model for magnetism um, people who claim that i know there's people even in the chat today who are saying it i mean here's an example a million, here's a person saying millions of people understand relativity. No, what millions of people, this is the way I would put it. Millions of people can repeat the story of the logic supposedly behind relativity. But even in its, in its assumptions, it's paradoxical. You have to sort of accept the people who go and um, uh, Alexander Unsker told me, he says, you know, David, the brightest minds don't go into particle physics. They don't go into theoretical physics. In fact, when I did my movie and we have, I've Steve, uh, Dr. Kel, uh, Kelsey outside saying he has to unteach special relativity to his grad students. He says that on my film, he, when I called him a particle uh, theoretical physicist, you thought I just told it, you know, I, I uh, said a bad thing about his mom. He said, don't you ever call me a, theoretical physics he's a physicist there's nothing theoretical about physics it's physical and and i so the problem is is that when you get people who can repeat it that is you and i go to uh, there's like there's like three people that go to, that take physics 101 okay i'm going to be the physics student that um just uh, uh is um uh, a person who uh when I hear it, it doesn't make sense and it makes me really mad. I don't understand it. And so I want to know that and I go off. Let's say you go into it. You don't care. You're a writer. Yeah, it sounds stupid. It sounds crazy. It sounds like it doesn't make sense, but you're going to study it, get a good grade, regurgitate everything that you learned, right? You write it down. You put it all down. You'll get a passing grade. You could get a PhD that way. And that's what people do. This idea that millions of people understand relativity is that millions of people say they understand relativity when it's does it's unintelligible in my offense and remember when you were talking about how things are are not good they're bad models relativity has paradoxes in its own assumptions and so what 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 i was saying in my little meme there is that it's not that um you can't understand relativity the way people say you understand relativity is go to school take the tasks regurgitate everything we tell you whether you believe it or not and then therefore you you now know you say i understand relativity but if you really sit down and try to understand it's and unintelligible so the idea that a person says here in the chat says millions of people understand relativity i i disagree what they do understand is like uh, how many millions of people believed in the iraq war that that iraq had weapons of mass destruction we were told that Okay, so you can put down in their chat right now, millions of people believe that we had uh, uh, Saddam Hussein had millions of weapons of mass destruction. Did he? Nope, he didn't. And so just because people say it, just because they say they understand it, to me what happens in relativity is that people say they understand it, but they really don't. They can repeat what is told to them. They can repeat the what I call faux logic or fake logic. And then when you don't understand it and you go, wait a minute, that's, you can't have one and the other, you're looked upon as you're not smart enough or you didn't understand it. Does that make sense or? Mm -hmm. And Einstein had doubts too. I have oh, yeah. a quote later in this article. And he also had 
a later theory called the unified field theory that he yes. said could replace relativity, but people didn't seem to catch on to that. Was that in this article? I don't remember. Yeah, the quote, you could probably find it by searching Einstein. Yeah. Okay. Not well, that. Well, not that one, yeah. No. Um, not that one. Not that one. Not that one. Okay. I'm sorry. Not that one. Okay, there it is. I got it. So yeah. let's read. Let's read this. This is good to read here. Then, uh, to Unsecker, physics entered a dead end in 1930. I do agree with him on that. To Borkert, yeah. it happened in 1905. Yep, I can agree with both of those. I guess Wallace Thorn Wallace Thornhill wrote. Sadly, we have wasted a century or more. Remembering that Wallace Thornhill in 2010 didn't believe that way, which is good yeah. for him. I applaud him. I really do. Yeah, and, it's good to focus on on electric how we've changed or when we've learned and not forget that because if you remember how much you keep changing then you're more open to change and exactly yeah, exactly to point that out absolutely so mm -hmm. going back he said wallace thornhill wrote sadly we are wa we have wasted a century or more einstein who himself had doubts wrote to a colleague in 1949 six years before he died you can you can imagine that i look back on my life's work with calm satisfaction but far, but from nearby it looks quite different there's not a single concept of which i am convinced that it will stand firm i feel uncertain whether i I am in general on the right track. Yeah, that that is astounding. And yet we do not see, we don't hear that at all. And I don't know if you know the backstory to this, but the real reason Einstein is continually uh, uh, stayed around is because of a, a university in Israel who Einstein uh, willed his likeness and his theory to this university in Israel because he was Jewish. Oh. and. Mm -hmm. Einstein in 1970, 1960, 70, 80, 90 was the second highest grossing dead celebrity of all time. Wow. He was making $12 million a year for the university, for, um, from Israel University. Mm. You think they're going to let go of that cash cow? You think they're going to let him die and be wrong? No way. So they have, I have seen them. They, they took... <coughs> They have uh, worked and took over uh, the um, Facebook page. The person who's working in Facebook page, I know the guy. He's a maybe <laughs> early early thirties. He's I don't think he's from the United States, but he owns that. He works directly with with those people who are the Einstein estate, and they keep him going. In fact, um, I put a lot of comments on there. But this is quite astounding. What what did you think when you when you found that? When did you find this? Uh, was it during writing the article? This Einstein uh, quote. The quote, I found it somewhere. It might have been in Borkert's book. Okay. Yeah, he had a few quotes like that. Right, right. I think it was somewhere or online somewhere, but right. it's definitely real. It's from a biography someone wrote of him quoting the letter. Right. But I want to read more Einstein to like find more quotes like that. It'll be interesting to get collect more of that yeah it was really interesting unfortunately a, a, a one of the people in my film and a dear friend i got to know him i just love the guy to death his he was dr edward dowdy the guy from nasa and he mm -hmm. was the one out there i think he has an extinction shift theory which is really fascinating i love i loved his work but he unfortunately he passed away just recently mm. um, he was fluent in German. He was one of the most intelligent guys I've met. If you met him, he looked just like a guy, like your uncle at a at some place that you would never ever imagine you would be talking at a high level about something, right? But mm -hmm. he said to me, and he said many times in his talks, that when he read the German work of Einstein, the English translation was much more, how do you say, firm ground it was much more, how do you say, convincing than Einstein's words in, in German. That Einstein, when he wrote, it was, if you look at our book, my dad and I's book, we talk about, you know, this all could be wrong, right? I mean, you don't have many people who are trying to have a, who have a model who say, you know, the truth of the matter is this could be all wrong and, you know, who knows, it could happen. 
Um, but uh, w when you when you see that from a person, he said that when he looked at and read his feelings was that the things that we take as as very strict. Um, how do you say uh, the speed of light is the same measured by all different reference frames. He said there were certain things that Einstein wrote in German that when we translated them became much different in their, how do you say, solidity, in their firmness. You know, when you write, obviously, you as a writer know that you can write sentences that sort of, you know, they, they're not, they don't have a real good basis. They're, you know, the character is in a place where their feet don't feel like they're on the ground, right? Well, it turns out that a lot of these phrases that Einstein said were not as strong and emphatic as what the English translations were, because the people who were translating it were already believing in all this stuff and just thought it was great. And so when they translated it, it was much firmer. So it was very, very similar to what you were saying. OK, um, now you also you also mention um, in here uh, about you were looking at, you know, government reports and thing, gravity control, et cetera, superluminal speeds over unity. Now, you're interested in, in, in that area. Are you just new to that area or? I am interested in, I am new to that area of okay. extraterrestrials. I just somehow just started getting interested in it around 2020. Have you noticed in mainstream media more talk of extraterrestrials, the government yeah. released some videos? Yeah, I have. Um, mm -hmm. I, have a, I have a very different opinion about it myself. Mm -hmm. um, I worked um, because of my work in artificial intelligence and computer science. I've worked on some mm -hmm. projects can't talk about. I know a lot of that kind of stuff, unfortunately, is literally put out there as a distraction. Mm -hmm. And that is, while the industrial war machine makes billions and trillions of dollars off of war and destroying the planet and people, they want people to be distracted in any way they can. It's the same way they want to do, as you said, this is one of the great things about this organization. You can have the really great ether theory. I will sit here and I'll try to understand it and all that. And I can disagree that it doesn't exist. The problem with is, is that when we disagree as a people that we're spending all this time and money on war, when we could be spending it on, like you said, um, you know, new technologies, trying to support people like um, Jeff Yi and his model, um, uh, other people in their model, uh, James Carter has a model, um, all these different people, um, uh, Glenn Borker, my, my dad and I, all of these people, why, why don't we spend time with these? Because these people could come up with stuff that we could do. Unfortunately, those kinds of things are out there in a distraction. If you notice that we have gone to war or trying to go to war, the United States is pushing everything button it can to try to go to war again. Those kinds of things of UFOs kind of percolate up again. I myself, with and, and I, this is the way I look at it, it Borkert's infinity of the chances of what we have in our level in this part of the universe. To me, can there be extraterrestrials? Can be. In, infinite, in the infinite universe may say that the probability is extremely small that for us to have maybe to travel at the speed of light, for instance, I'll give you another example, for us to travel faster than the speed of light, there are faces full of stuff. It's either an ether or if it's particles like what we have in ours, those particles are there. There's something there, at least in our, if you go to the speed of light and speed of light is very intimately linked to the atoms and the way they're constructed, we're gonna to have to come up with something very different for us to be able to go past that. And those kinds of things come from new models of the universe. But as the extraterrestrials and the UFOs, I, I have to take, I take those more with a grain of salt just because I know from the inside that that's sort of, um, you know, we do have organizations whose goal it is, the CIA's goal is to distract even the American people. We have, we have documents from leaked documents saying that they leak stuff to the American people about distraction. So in my mm -hmm. opinion, I don't believe that. I believe that's part of that distraction. And I also believe, according to 
Borkert and more and to George Coyne about the consciousness that our minds can come up with all kinds of things when we see things. And, you know, the, the human mind is very ample when it comes to all, all kinds of, of these things. So I, I personally don't believe those are. Would I say 100% that they aren't? No way. I'll never say 100% that they're not. Mm -hmm. but my own personal opinion is they're mm -hmm. mostly distractions. And they, if you watch the UFO stuff, they always come up higher when we are in the middle of starting to do the space force, right? And mm -hmm. we have people, mm -hmm. we have, you know, SpaceX sending stuff up that they can't talk about. Whenever you get people, oh, look over there, there's a UFO. I'm not saying that they don't exist and they, you know what I'm saying? I'm not, mm -hmm. I will... If you ask me to bet a hundred dollars on that, I won't, because I can be wrong. But that's that's the way I have seen it, because I've seen over sixty years the ebb and flow of that, and it always corresponds with new technologies in the in the military industrial complex or war or whatever. But can it be? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's definitely a distraction. Whatever is in the news, but yeah. but I also have come to believe that there are advanced aliens okay yeah nearby and like visiting and i've also become convinced that ufos some of them are man-made and some of them are by aliens now if, if it's the case you always have the question with the aliens why aren't they visiting why aren't they talking with us i mean it seems really really strange it's sort of like again i'm not it's not criticism but religion that you know you have god you know how do you prove that it's faith <clears throat> it seems like you know that seems to be the same way with aliens it's always kind of faith or we kind of see it but we never get there it seemed like it would have to with eight billion people on this planet someone would get a photograph of the, the thing and you know it, it why would they be so good at avoiding it I don't understand that part. I mean, what what would you say to that? Mm. Yeah, I've had that question too, and I've just become more and more convinced that there is communication. Mm. There's okay. this one guy named Stephen Greer who right. meditates to communicate with them. And then I've learned about all these instances where government or corporate people have seen some evidence or had some photograph or something, and then they had to cover it up. Stephen Greer has collected like a thousand government and corporate witnesses saying all this stuff. So it's just like pretty small. So sure, not sure. that many people hear about this. That's sure. what I, sure. so far, that's what I think. I've only been looking into this for two years. Right. And but as I become convinced that either the military or aliens have craft that can defy gravity, that also encourages me to look into alternative physics because mainstream physics just says it's obviously impossible. Right. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think the way I look at it is <clears throat> sort of that way where I'm really looking at how first of all let's get phys let's try to get the basic stuff right we're, mm. we're in quantum mechanics and we're we're in quarks and all these ridiculous characteristics like half a spin <clears throat> which somebody tried to actually explain you know uh who's great at this is uh alexander unsucker he just tears apart all of these ridiculous attributes they put on these things you know we need to just get to the point where all right, let's try. Let's look at all the models. Hey, anybody who's got a model for gravity any or light or whatever, the whole thing or part of it, let's look at it. We have to. Can we get any evidence for it? Can we do experiments for it? Because the moment we we decide that it's the Jeff Yee model or it's the Borkert ether model or it's the de Hilster particle model, whatever it is, we then have the ability to start manipulating it. I mean, for instance, one of the things about our model is everything has to be a force of something real. If something is a force, it's got to be a mass behind it. Yeah, we know I'm putting we have all this air around us. We can't see it. We know it's there. So that's our model. And one of the things about this, that model that's interesting about that model is that everything's a force. Therefore, we can start calculating forces. For instance, we know in our model we have to have faster than light particles. And those particles are, are at a, a lower level, just like... Um, Borkert 
has a, a level of ether below ether one, ether two, ether three. It's the same thing that we have. Mm -hmm. Those yeah, things, that, yeah. That's something in common. In your model, are G1 particles electrons? Well, they take the place they take the place of an electron. They are not electrons, but they take the place of it. Because if you look at the electron, we we claim we know perfectly well its attributes, but my dad's an electrical engineer. We have read everything about the electron and the, I think it's the uh, oil drop experiment to tell us the properties. There's a lot of assumptions in there. So the yeah. truth is there is something there. We call it an electron. Is it this one thing? Yeah, and then we put a minus sign on it, and that automatic magically makes it move, which is, is, in my opinion, stupid. So, anyways, yeah, the mm -hmm. in our model we have that. Uh, yeah, anything that travels at the speed of light. So. Yeah, and I've heard you mention something about neutrinos not being real. I asked because in Wallace Thornhill's recent essay, he says that there's an ether of neutrinos what was yes. the thing you were talking about neutrinos yes well first of all i know the neutrino was postulated to save relativity in mm -hmm. 1930 uh Pauli, uh wolfgang Pauli, uh said when they were looking at radioactivity remember in the early part of the 20th century radioactivity was huge it was the biggest thing in in the in the, the earliest part of the, the 20th century it's really mm -hmm. what where everything started for the atomic subatomic level Mm -hmm. And what happened was when you have a ra radioactive element, there's no energy being put into it, yet energy is coming out of it. Mass is sitting there and literally energy is coming out of it. And when it was coming out of it, electrons in this case, um, Pauli said, well, if you believe in special relativity, you got to believe that when those electrons come out near the speed of light, you're going to have to measure more energy because the closer to the speed of light, there's going to be more energy. Their energy is related to the speed, right? And mm -hmm. so the what happened was when you looked at the experiment of here's here's the uh, radioactivity and the, and the electrons coming out, you would say, okay, we're expecting 0.86 elect million electron volts. That's what we expect from chemistry. And guess what? That's exactly what we see. There's no extra energy there. But you say if you put magical special relativity equations on it and it's moving close to the speed of light, you're going to have to have more energy, even though it all bounced out without it. That is the so um, Polly said, if that's the case and you guys believe in special relativity, there must be another particle coming out of there that we can't see hmm. and it can't have a charge. It can't have mass, which is completely absurd. I mean, it's just absurd. Hmm. The neutrino was not accepted in mainstream science until the 1940s or 50s. Hmm. And so it was meant. And if you if you go back to the history, you will not find that. Who found that was my mentor, um, Dr. Ricardo Carazzani, who had a if you go to autodynamics.org, he is the foremost expert on why. And then he found when I was with Carazzani in the 1990s, he found an experiment done by Van de Graaff. You know, those big machines where they put your hand on something, and your hair goes up. Yeah, that's a Van de Graaff machine. Well, Van de Graaff did with Buchner did an experiment that showed that the neutrino doesn't exist, the electron neutrino, which is the supposedly the most important neutrino. So he did an experiment at MIT in 1946 that shows the neutrino doesn't exist. Everybody ignores it. Go for, fast forward to uh, Wall Thornhill and a lot of dissidents. So they think ether exists. We don't, we, what is it? Oh, it's neutrinos because we can't see it. We can't detect it. They are willing to throw away all, all the problems that that it was invented, that it's an, a ridiculous particle that had no mass and no charge and, and all that, so that they can cling to the idea that, that that's what ether is. It's actually, I know of one guy from Russia whose gravity theory says that um, uh, the neutrino is the graviton. And we also know many etherists say that neutrinos ether. So what they do is they close their eyes, plug their ears, and then they, they don't say anything. They, they don't want to look at the history. I, I can't convince them, but that's the history. So if you know the history of the neutrino, you know it was invented. It's a, it's a fictitious particle. And you know that 1946, experiment by Vuchner and Van, Van de Graaff shows without a beyond a shadow of doubt that the electron neutrino, which is the best one, the most certain, doesn't exist. And they make neutrino detectors 
the more they shield the neutrino detectors, the less neutrinos they have. So even the neutrino detectors, if you want to know anything about neutrinos, go to autodynamics.org. Anybody watching, read about it. Dr. Karazani was, uh, was spent his life uh, looking at that particular problem. So it's, a, it's, it's dissidents trying to pick up on ether. That's what it is. Okay. Mm, so. Yeah. And another thing I wanted to talk about was the, in Einstein wrong, you had a guy who talked about how on GPS they ignore Einstein's relativity. Yes. Yes. Um, doctor, I mean, not, he wasn't a doctor. His name was Ron Hatch. Again, he passed away just probably over a year ago. He was the, actually my first investor. He bought my camera at the time when before high def was. So uh, he, I, I got to know about him because of the MPA. He was, he was one of the pioneers in GPS. He started Navcom, which was then purchased by John Deere. John Deere drives tractors along the, the ground, right? And he, he, he was, his company was bought out and he, he became, I don't know if he's a millionaire, but pretty close to it. And so by the time he died, he had over 30 patents in GPS. During that time, he got involved and looked at Einstein's relativity. And it turned out that when he looked at it, he saw that, first of all, we're not even using anything like that. We're not, look, we're not using anything like special relativity in our calculations. It's not there. We, they do signal calculations. That is, there's a satellite, there's the Earth, the satellite's moving, the signal takes so long to go there, there's a traveling of the speed of light, <coughs> and they do their calculations. Well, it turns out that they don't use relativity. Yet, when I saw Bill Science, Bill Nye, the science guy, have you ever heard of him? Yeah, yeah, a lot. Yeah, my daughter was totally flipped out when I got to meet him. I got to meet him and talk with him. He, during his lecture, he takes out his phone, holds it up to us in the audience and says, our phone, our phone wouldn't work, our GPS wouldn't work if it wasn't for special and general relativity. That is a lie. It's a complete lie. In fact, mm -hmm. the reason, there's a couple of reasons why we, that's, we can't check it. Number one, GPS is a trillion dollar business. It's not a billion dollar bills. It's a trillion dollar business. Mm. Knowing where you are on the earth is lucrative. So I if you go to Navcom that. with Ron Hatch and say, could you give me all your calculations <clears throat> for how you calculate the GP, how your tractors to be within one centimeter on a, on a field on a, in, anywhere on earth, they're not going to give you anything. But I, uh, I remember a friend of mine, Greg Volk, who is another person like myself who likes all and helps all these dissidents. He was sitting in an audience when Ron Hatch was talking and the guy next to him says, hey, I work in GPS. It's a dirty little secret. We don't use relativity. And so you had I asked Ron, I said, for the film, I want you to come up with a quote about relativity. He says relativity isn't supported by GPS. GPS shows the flaws in relativity. The reason people say it, and you, the, the question you're going to have is, well, why do they keep repeating it? The reason is, is they don't want to say Einstein's wrong. No one wants to say that. That's like saying Jesus Christ was a bad person. He wasn't a bad person, obviously, and it's a different thing. But it's like saying Gandhi was a horrific man, right? So what, what, what happens is they say that according to some of their folk um, setups about the way things work, if you go to a person who is a physicist at any university, he's going to sort of draw some what I call um, uh, folk uh, uh, folkology about how GPS supposedly is going to follow this, the uh, the GPS and the adjustments for the clock. This is one of the things they talk about: adjustments for a clock. If you take a clock here on Earth and put it up in space, it goes faster or slower. I can't remember. It goes, it changes. You have to make an adjustment. Mm -hmm. So it turns out that if you put any clock, if you take a clock that's got a pendulum and put it up there, it's going to change. Anything that's mechanical is going to change because of gravity, not because of space time. It's gravity. Mm -hmm. So because atomic clocks, clocks are made of atoms, atomic clocks are made out of atoms. When you put an atomic clock, you get a different reading up there because the gravity, whatever that force is, affects clocks it's called clock retardation it's not it's not the slowing down of time 
And so all of these things together, you have you have the GPS people wanting to cling to Einstein and saying that relativity is used because, oh, yeah, they have to adjust for general relativity. No, they're adjusting for gravity. General relativity is one of the ideas of what space of uh, gravity is, but it doesn't tell you what space time is. It's just an idea with with equations. Right. It doesn't. It's mm -hmm. like it's no better than Newton. You know, mm -hmm. if you think that Einstein's better than Newton gravity, no, they're both equations that describe how a body falls through gravity, but none of them tell you what gravity is. So GPS <clears throat> is, is said to be using relativity because of that. The other thing in the film was that when they put the clocks on the, the um, planes and flew them around the earth and left one clock on the, uh, on the ground and the other one flying and they came back and they said the time was different, therefore they showed that time slowed down. It turned out for them to fit the data, and this is in my movie, to fit the data to that. They had to, the clocks had to know 23 hours before the experiment started that they were going on a trip because they had to literally pick a line to, to fit Einstein's theory of relativity. They had to draw a line and that line happened to intersect at the, at the start, not at the start of the experiment, but 23 hours before they even started the experiment. And no one, they don't talk about that. In fact, in, in the person in my movie got that data accidentally because the, both the people who, who did the experiment were in their 80s and they did a, made the number one sin in, in science. They sent my, my uh, this pro professor, Dr. Everly Spencer, they sent her the raw data. What you do in science is keep the raw data to yourself and then just give your interpretation. Because that way they can't, I can't say, you know, Tao, you wrote this article, but I looked at the data you looked at and you interpreted that completely wrong, right? So that's that's kind of the story of GPS. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. So um, uh, let's see, we have some time. We have some people in the green room. I have Harry. We have some people. Um, if you have a question for Tao, um, let's see, it was accepted in the, when it was detected. Yeah, that, that's... You know, neutrino was accepted in the 1950s when it was detected, but that's absolutely get here. Here's that question. What's the answer to that question? I know Kevin's not going to listen to this, but everyone else will. The, the question Karazani got was if they're not detecting neutrinos in the neutrino detectors, what are they detecting then? The answer is a question. Why do they shield neutrino detectors? They shield neutrino detectors by putting them in underground mines, by putting them in Antarctica to shield them from false hits. So the detector has to be shielded from false hits. And the more they have, they have shielded the false hits, the less neutrinos they have detected. So the answer to the question of whether they're detecting, they're detecting something else, not neutrinos. Hmm. So, that's the answer to that question. Okay. Anyways, um, questions or comments from the peanut gallery? Anybody? So yeah, that's fascinating. Let's see. Um, Van de Graaff's experiment only showed that the results, the uh, of a previous experiments wasn't neutrinos. Not that neutrino doesn't exist. Um, no, they said that the they proved that they did prove they showed that in the experiment where neutrinos in the original experiment where neutrinos were supposed to be detected they are not they eliminated the possibility that it was something else so that's not true this is what you get with people who want to cling to the neutrino is that here's here's you know what somebody said from a university to me uh Tao, about the neutrino this is what they said i said do you know do you know the uh the history of the neutrino that it was postulated to, that's it was to save special relativity and that the only reason it was postulated because even though what they measured that is the chemical reaction of the electrons and the radiation coming out perfectly balanced that is energy in equaled exactly energy out and, the, and if you apply special relativity you get magical energy you know what they said to me oh that history that that was wrong it's not important but that's where it came from I, I don't understand that the neutrino wouldn't exist we wouldn't even say its name today if we didn't have that experiment so that's what happens if you get a, an experiment that truly shows that they're going to say well it's something else it's like expanding universe if you if redshift is wrong 
then they'll say, oh, something else is right. So they're going to cling to it, cling to it, cling to it till they die. And uh, but so even, even, yeah. mainstream physics have measured some particle that they're not sure what it is and they're calling it a neutrino. No, uh, yeah, that's that's what it is. What 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 they're doing is they're ass what's what they're doing is they're assuming that there's so there's so much energy that's supposed to be there, and they can't. Well, they what they measure is what's predicted by normal chemistry, but because of relativistic equations, mm -hmm. they those equations require more energy that isn't there. It's a fudge thing. So mm -hmm. you throw in a. It's like me saying, oh. You're going to put gas in your car, but you should, you know, you put it only at five gallons, you can only go 50 miles. Well, it should be going 70 miles. So there, or, or you're going seven, you know, you should be going 70 miles. And therefore, there's got to be 20 gallons or something there that makes that go. And you, you don't even agree with the idea that it's supposed to go 70. See, no one's arguing that point. If you know special relativity is wrong, which any person who I know who is a critical thinker has looked at it has found out, these people, then you say, okay, it's wrong. Well, then you have to say, well, if it's wrong, applying that to decay is wrong. So therefore the neutrino and its complete existence is because of, of that. So, okay, I have a person waving to me, so I'll bring them up. Hey, dad, I uh, can't hear you, you are muted still. You're still muted. Uh oh, we're gonna go on the muted thing. So, okay, I'll bring you down. Working get on yourself. It. There. Oh, there you go. There I go. Hey, uh, uh, to change the subject, uh, uh, Tal, I, I listed in your bio. You say you're an artist, but uh, haven't heard much about uh, what kind of art you do. Or uh, could you uh, address that for us? Yeah, I used to draw really cute animals, really simple animals like hamsters but then in the past like six or seven years i've started drawing what i call mandalas and they're really detailed small i can show them i'll show them and well, that, there was one of those in the article no no that was something else but it was on as well i can David show you, show you. I'll, I'll show you there's a bunch of them here so um in fact uh here we go i'll show them put them up on the you screen. could drop me out Right there. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about those mandalas. I do have an, another question from the crowd here. Um, we have some uh, 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 other comments, but tell me, tell us about those mandalas. What's the size, first of all, so you can, people can get a perspective of it? They're eight inches by eight inches, and I spend a really long time on them. I started drawing them well recovering from pharmaceutical drug addiction right and i was just staying in my room alone a lot avoiding right. social interaction and i just worked on these a lot and listened to a lot of podcasts and i've continued just listening to stuff while drawing it's where i listen to a lot of your show right oh nice <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, I think they're, <clears throat> I want to know, how do you get so detailed in this? I mean, these things are, this is eight inches across. On my screen, it's about that. I mean, I'm seeing stuff in here that I don't even know mechanically how you're doing that. What, mm -hmm. what do you use? What yeah, do you I'll send you a print. It's really small, and I just get my face really close to the paper and have, have 0.02 or 0.2 millimeter pens. And I like to see how small I can get the detail. Do you, do you feel like you're sort of looking down in the Borker infinity world in some sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I do. And I like imagining that I'm drawing different worlds. And it also helps me think about scale because a lot of these are fractal where they'll have a right. shape and then the same shape will occur but in a smaller size and it really helps me imagine what the universe could be like right right it, it's it I, I think it was interesting what you say that, that it repeats itself it's one of the things about our model has like four basic movements in the universe right mm -hmm. and those things repeat at all levels mm -hmm. so if anything yeah. takes a curve at any level 
there's a gravitational field below it doing that. You know, if anything has an attraction, you know, a magnetic attraction, it's, it's happening because of... So I can, yeah, I can see, you know, you sort of... And, and also it's interesting because I watched your talk that mm -hmm. you did sort of pixel art. I think what was so amazing to me was, is when you were giving your talk, if you haven't say, look up um, Tao Lin art, and there's a 16 minute you presented to this group. I can't remember where, but mm -hmm. you had your pixel art in the very beginning. And it was hilarious, but it was, mm -hmm. it was really, it made you think. It sort of reminded me a little bit of conceptual art where people just, you know, went to the wall and wrote something down. And you had to imagine it. Mm -hmm. But you would say something there and I'd look at it and I'd go, I can totally see that. And if you looked how, I think what, what was most amazing to me about your artwork is, and I came from a completely different side, is that you, um, you just did the, the simplest possible thing for what you're trying to communicate and you could see it you know it was almost how simple of a something you could do and have it there and i think what the audience was laughing about is like yeah i see that too right away what was mm -hmm. what what was the what was it that you were thinking about when you did something like that because you're your titles were super long for something that if you looked at it an artwork had to be some of the most simple art i've ever seen mm -hmm. yeah i remember i know what you're talking about it might be hard for a viewer to imagine but it i like it might be just a drawing of a of a i remember there's one called gas powered alligator or something you know right drawing up an alligator right <laughs> and then oh here we go i found i found a few um mm. i found a few um not all of this is yeah pretty much let's see let me get up here add to stream here here's here's one um, mm -hmm. yeah yeah so here's some of them. sasquatch or sasquatch in bed okay. yeah i liked drawing these things i felt amused by them yeah i mean it was I, when you 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 really have to check out the um, um, the artwork it's on called, the video. So. Yeah, it's called the Lost Lecture. The oh, the Lost video. Lecture, right? Yeah, right. Check it out. I have Harry waving. I do see you, Harry. Um, don't worry, I'll get to you here. All right. So that's that was a question about your art. Let me bring somebody else up here. Um, we yeah, have thanks time. for asking about that. By yeah. the way, did your dad write? the electrical parts of the book and you wrote oh, the yes. rest or how did you do yeah um it was it was the collaboration was i spent actually the most in, one of the most interesting parts of the book i spent was writing computer programs to draw no particle the same way in our book because yeah. there was no way i wanted i wanted to show really the essence of like the borkian infinite world so mm -hmm. i did that and what yeah. happened was he came up with a, his view his model for light I'm, I'm bringing harry on just a minute harry and after he did that i collected all these other things we, we both knew about the graviton we both knew about yonel the stuff and the elect so we sort of took i sort of took the idea of the infinite world from from and you know the news work and all that and sort of put it together so i'm the one who took my dad's kind of idea and fit it into the bigger picture and then from both of there we went and i asked him i said you know we have a whole model for everything what does this say for the physicality of electronic circuits where we have zero really zero idea for that so that was something that's that's kind of how that works so yeah he did all that in fact he's writing a second book called the physics of electronic circuits mm -hmm. nice. okay harry you're on i got a question um you talked about the big bang and apparently you're interested in the big bang and the universe i'm not really so much interested in whether you believe in the big bang or not i think that's um you know that's not really my question my question is as an artist and uh, you're a writer so you live in a world of imagination uh, to a large extent my question is do you believe that the universe is alive or has some kind of life force with it or do you believe that it's purely materialistic uh, mechanism 
I do. I do think it's alive. It just looks alive, like zooming out to galaxies and super clusters and then to the cosmic web. It seems like everything's moving in a way that is organized from above somehow or from somewhere else because it's not just like a pile of dead twigs or rocks or something. It's all like moving within some kind of structure that's like a web with these voids that's also shaped somewhat like a sponge. Based so on are you familiar with uh, ARP's idea about quasars or galaxy seeds? Have about quasars, them? yeah, yeah, about galaxies emitting quasars and the quasars growing into galaxies. Right, you're familiar with that? Is that, mm -hmm. is that a interesting idea to you? Uh, do you find that persuasive or exciting or can you kind of tell me, you know, talk about how you feel about that? I mean, you're an artist and a writer, so, you know. Yeah, yeah, it seems, uh, I'm not Harry's sure. Harry's also I, a writer. He's, a, he's been a science writer, but I, I mean, you're, he is a writer too. I just want to interject that. It's uh, mm -hmm. not, not fiction, but more uh, history and science. Mm -hmm. Nice. I'm not sure I knew the mainstream explanation for how galaxies form before I encountered ARP's explanation. And ARP's explanation made sense to me and seemed amazing and also fractal because animals birth things too that grow into bigger versions of themselves. And if ARP is right, galaxies like give off baby galaxies that grow into galaxies, it seems to make sense. And then just his explanation of it made sense too. One thing I wasn't sure about is whether these galaxies just grow into satellite galaxies or whether they grow into full-size galaxies. Do you know anything about that? <laughs> well, I'm not really sure about ARP's, ARP's interpretation. Mm -hmm. um, um, I think, you know, uh, I just want to mention a few things. There's a uh, Vorontsov Vilamanov, who's a Russian uh, scientist, has this idea that he talks about gemination, which he says that galaxies reproduce like plants. Mm. It's very interesting. Um, uh, that's kind of an obscure thing. But ARP's idea is kind of similar, the seed idea. Okay, and so you have this idea that galaxies are created more like an organic process. It's not this materialistic process where there's this big bang and it creates this cloud of gas and then these gas condenses and it forms stars and the stars, you know, they they explode and you create more gas and that condenses. And then it's a very materialistic, uh, you know, something that you can produce mathematical equations to describe, but it doesn't really seem to fit what you see when you look out at the universe. Now, I'd like to point out to you that there are a lot of uh, new images on the web from the uh, James Webb Telescope um, on YouTube, and um, you might want to look at those. They're quite exciting photographs, and um, but they describe galaxies when they're, you know, like you might have a galaxy that has a daughter galaxy. They say, well, that's just two galaxies passing by each other. They, they really don't have this idea that maybe um, galaxies reproduce kind of organically the way animals do. Um, you might find that exciting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll look into that. Could you say his name again? Vorontsov Ilaminov. I can't really pronounce it. He's a Russian guy. Um, and I'm just pointing out that this uh, idea of galaxies reproducing non-materialistically, um, mm -hmm. kind of like organisms, uh, living organisms, is um, it's not unique to ARP. And um, I, I don't think it's unique to him. I think there are a number of people who view, view the universe this way. Mm -hmm. And... Um, 
I just think that might be, you know, that's kind of an appealing idea as opposed to the materialistic science idea, which, you know, um, you know, they interpret everything in terms of this materialism that uh, has to be deterministic and everything has to follow an equation type of view of the world. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks for the question. Okay. Thank you so much. We're coming near the end. Uh, there was, a, I think, a good question here from George Coyne, and that is, please ask Tal whether he's planning to write more or on alternative phys physics and cosmology. Yeah, I do. The article I published was like 2,500 words, and I'm, I think I want to expand that into a chapter that's five or 6,000 words that I might include in a book I'm working on on the topic of aliens. And I've talked about that. So I do plan to write more and I'm still researching. I had like five or 10 physics and cosmology books to read and other stuff to absorb. Oh, that's great. So you, so you complete, you, you continue your journey in critical thinking and in, in, in the sciences area. Um, it, it's funny because one of the things as an artist, and I don't have the answer to this really, <clears throat> because you know I, I chose early on not to do art for a living because then you ended up, you know, making being coming a character of yourself. Mm -hmm. um, I, I I actually got into uh, a very prestigious uh, gallery, the uh, L.A. County Museum of Art, when I was in the early '90s, when I was 30. But I could already see people pigeonholing me, and I said, you mm -hmm. know, I, I don't want to do art because somebody wants me to do something purple the size, you know, or, or, or so I decided that's going to be my own and I do that on my own. Mm. One of the things meeting the science side was what is this new group? Normally what happens and one of the things I'd like to, I'd like to think about doing um, that would be a sort of uh, a branch from this would be to do what they did in the 1890s and 19, early 1900s, and that is philosophers, musicians, uh, um, artists, writers, um, scientists, all got together who wanted to talk about all the things, including science, and it influenced everybody. Everybody was influenced by everybody, and they were always on the cutting edge. They didn't talk about, oh, explain how quant you know, mechanic, me the uh, Copenhagen quantum mechanic model works. They, they don't care about that. They're always like, you know, no, that, that, we know that stuff. What's what's on the edge? Where are things going wrong? What don't we really know? And that kind of stuff influences art. And one of the questions I always had, my brother started, my brother's a very good writer, but he never took it up. But he started writing some fiction based on some new ideas, Karazani's ideas of the universe, etc. And it was really compelling because it was a whole different kind of look at the world. Mm -hmm. I mean, imagine yourself doing an auto auto i'm gonna i'm gonna plant a seed here i hope an auto um uh auto fiction about you in a world that's governed by one or even more than one where you could actually as yourself visit the borkard world the jeff Yee world the oh. model world of of uh, and other other peoples you know those are three that i that are, are work being worked on now oh. what would that be yeah, I could just write science fiction based on these alternative well, physics. You can do auto fiction, I guess, because you could write your about yourself in this world, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, what I mean, you seem to be walking in that. I'm, you know, again, I, I don't have time to do things like this, but uh, I, I think it's going to be interesting if we can get more and more artists mm -hmm. and musicians and other people in here where we're really discussing, you know, points that really are on the cutting edge mm -hmm. so the, the you know 100 years from now these people we're talking about like borkert or whatever could you know very well be what people are going to be teaching because that's going to be the future so yeah so, i want to read science fiction books by people who don't believe in einstein and see what they think of yeah, I think one of the problems with science fiction is they always try to fit it in there, right? Oh, be, after Einstein, there was this guy and he came up with a, it's like, mm -hmm. wait a minute, what about a science fiction where we like, the 20th century was a wrong turn and mm -hmm. we take, you know, the turns that people are looking at right now, mm -hmm. which is actually much more Newtonian than anything. 
Um, mm -hmm. So, I mean, that would that would be interesting. So uh, I want to thank you very much for coming on. Um, it would be yeah. really appreciated. And if you had a, did you want to have a few words about um, your your coming work and what you'll be doing uh, right the the next what's your next phase where do you where are you at now yeah I could say a little bit we've talked about when things started to go wrong and my next book argues that a recent or a time that things started going wrong was 6,500 years ago and at that point people became more warlike and male dominated and that's continued to this day and it has resulted in just all the things we've talked about being wrong being wrong or at least that's what i plan to write about and explore in my next book so and, so so you work with vintage uh do they yeah. continue to say hey what are you working on i mean is is that mm -hmm. They haven't. Well, my editor there moved to a different publishing company right. and I haven't really talked to him. So with my next book, I'll just give it to my agent and then he'll try to sell it. But there is a limit with big publishers and what I can say. And it's always a conversation with them and a compromise. Right. Yeah, and I just want to like try to introduce these ideas slowly and as much as I can. Yeah, and I, I mean, you can, you can, yeah, I mean, you can somewhat people start saying, "Oh, he's a crackpot," right? Mm -hmm. that's, yeah, that's, yeah, that's the idea. But you know what I think too, though, people are start this whole thing of this woke movement. Even though they took this this really great word woke, I love the word and made mm -hmm. it into the people in power made it in, turned it on us. They always do that. Whatever good mm -hmm. word goes out there, Black Lives Matter, woke movie, whatever it is, they'll take it, turn it, make it a weapon and shoot it at you and blame you by, by saying it. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing about that is people are questioning a lot more. The average person, mm -hmm. you know, they're realizing what you see on TV, what they say. I mean, that's why. Why do you think the uh, cable news is dying? It's dying. It's dying with the, the generation because, you know, Someone says this, but then you go on Facebook and you watch what's happening there and you're seeing a completely different thing and you're going, well, wait a minute, how come, you know, kind of when I grew up in the 70s, journalism was journalism. People, if you know, if you were a journalist and you were telling people something that wasn't true, that was a, some politician wanted, they'd come after you and you'd be out of the business. <clears throat> Now it's the opposite. If you come up and say, like Assange, right, that, you know, America's committing war crimes, which they are every day, you know, instead of being praised and getting the Pulitzer Prize, you're, 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 you're ousted, you're ousted. And that's so the same, you're, you have that same worry a little bit in the publishing world. Is that the, true then? Yeah, a tiny bit. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I'll work with my editor. I work with my editor on my novel too, on figuring out right. like when I was going too far and I right. replaced some ideas with other ideas. So, so yeah. you don't feel, you feel that those kinds of moves don't really get in the way of what you're trying to say, because a lot of times people are worried that it has to be perfectly, uh, for perfectly this my way or no way. So you mm -hmm. do have ability to do adjustments. Mm -hmm. Yeah, to be flexible and to stuff because I feel like I could just keep going deeper and deeper right. into this, but I have to stop at some point right. if I want a publisher to publish me, like right. self-publishing maybe, but then my audience would be much smaller. Right, mm -hmm. right. I did feel even when we wrote our book, I mean, our book in the beginning, the first year and six years later were night and day. And we really did think about the reader. We were thinking to ourselves, this may be interesting to us. But is this going to be too, you know, not good for the reader? And it's going to be, oh, yeah, they're going. Yeah, he, 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 there is, I guess what it is in life, you are writing because this is something you want to share. And when you share, you have to say, you know, it's like saying, oh, this is the greatest cake in the world. And you give this person, you know, 17 cakes on top of their head and, and you mm -hmm. expect them to eat it all. You know, mm -hmm. I guess in the in the creating of something to give, you do have to. I think people who are successful have to know, yeah, there is an audience and and what's how you can get that across because it's going to do you no good 
or any of us any good if we don't do that. So listen, thank you so much. Uh, people really, I think, enjoyed this. Again, this is going to be available. Um, it's available immediately on YouTube. Mm -hmm. And who knows, maybe we can have you back um, sometime. Uh, but you know, let me know. Yeah. And um, so uh, thank you so much. And I guess sign off for everybody. Say goodbye. Give your last few words here. Yeah, thank you for having me on. This has been fun coming on again. Maybe when I finish my book and when it's coming out, possibly. Yep, I think that's great. And you can mm -hmm. always pop in in the green room and ask questions. You know that. So. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, maybe I'll do that. I've yeah. enjoyed seeing you know, and what. And, and if you know people, I'm really thinking um, about trying to get more of a general audience. It wouldn't be through mm -hmm. this medium, but through maybe I even dissident science, maybe, and getting together a more ample talk mm -hmm. about how we can get all walks of life talking about science. This is more technical, this side, because we really get into the nitty gritty, but maybe a more a forum where on my dissident ch channel only where we could talk about, you know, science, but from all the perspectives and let everybody's have an input and not so detailed oriented. So I'll let you know about that. I'll, I'll keep you included. So yeah, that sounds interesting. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. It was great. Great talking with you, Tao. Yeah, you too. Bye. Okay. Bye-bye. Okay, folks. Thank you so much. And I really do appreciate everybody uh, putting up with this. It's not, not easy uh, to uh, get a person like this interested and obviously he's uh, Tao's very interested in these topics and everybody, what everybody's doing and i know people are just in the chat talking about neutrinos how they exist how they exist we'll, we'll do that one day we'll talk about neutrinos and, and come at me with that but um it's not important because could neutrinos exist yep um do i believe they don't know but i'm not right or wrong i'm not right on that uh that's just my opinion so that's what we all have to do is to make sure we all uh, can, in fact, stay in in, uh, in in discussion, not get on each other's case and call each other's names because it's stupid. Because every one of us can be wrong about what we're saying. Every one of us. And every one of us can be right as well. So um, really, really appreciate it. So uh, uh, let's see. There's somebody else saying it's not easy to find really original artists either. And that was original stuff for sure. So uh, I know Tao's there. Uh, absolutely. Uh, if you if you have not checked it out, check out his latest book, Leave Society. If you're not in if you not ever read about um, uh, auto auto uh, fiction, it's really great. And the name of the person in the book is Lee. Uh, that's very interesting. If you take uh, uh, Tao Lin's uh name and take off the end there you go so quite interesting uh i i recommend it very easy i think it's cost me 12 bucks it's not like our book which is like all color pages and it costs a lot more but uh uh yep 12 bucks uh look and we look forward to his book uh again and check him out just look up uh Taolin on youtube um uh, and, and his art he has a great that great lecture on art i recommend that and his other books as well i'm looking forward to uh, getting those and reading those as well so let's go out here and close out the show <laughs>